Welcome to Firelands Electric Cooperative's 82nd Annual Meeting of Members. Your cooperative exists to serve its members, and it's you, the member owners, who have elected your team of nine board members to govern the cooperative and its principals. These individuals contribute countless hours each year attending meetings, conferences, and being advocates on your behalf. We would like to take a moment and introduce your elected Board of Trustees. Board President, District 1 Representative Dan Schlomer lives in the Willard area with his wife Debbie. Dan serves our cooperative members located in Greenfield, Norwich, and Richmond Townships in Huron County. District 2 Representative Jean Lamoureux lives in the Greenwich area with his wife Sandy. Jean serves our cooperative members located in Cass, Greenwich, New Haven, and Ripley Townships in Huron County, and Ruggles Township in Ashland County. He also serves a portion of Blooming Grove Township in Richland County. District 3 Representative Steve Gray lives in the North Fairfield area with his wife Shirley. Steve serves our members located in Bronson, Fairfield, Heartland, and Prue Townships in Huron County. He also serves a portion of Fitchfield Township located west of State Route 250 in Huron County. Vice President District 4 Representative Bruce Leinbach lives in the New London area with his wife Dana. Bruce serves our members located in Clarksfield Township, a portion of Fitchfield Township east of State Route 250, north of the CSX Rail in New London Municipality, and New London Township in Huron County. He also serves a portion of Rochester Township in Lorain County. Secretary Treasurer District 5 Representative Carl Ayers lives in the Perrysville area with his wife Janet. Carl serves our cooperative members located in Monroe Township in Richland County and Green and Lake Townships in Ashland County. District 6 Representative Kevin Reedy lives in the Ashland area with his wife Debbie. Kevin serves our members located in Butler, Mifflin, and Weller Townships in Richland County. He also serves Clear Creek, Milton, Orange, and Mifflin Townships and Madison Township north of State Route 42 in Ashland County. District 7 Representative Rob Turk lives in the Perrysville area with his wife Kathy. He serves our cooperative members located in Mohican, Montgomery, Perry, and Vermilion Townships in Ashland County. District 8 Representative Andy Anderson lives in the Ashland area with his wife Donna. Andy serves our cooperative members located in Mifflin Township in Richland County and Mifflin Township south of State Route 42 in Ashland County. District 9 Representative John Martin lives in the New London area with his wife Melissa. John serves our cooperative members located south of the CSX Rail in New London Municipality and New London Township in Huron County. Kevin Reedy, your cooperative's trustee representing District 6, will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, member owners of Firelands Electric Cooperative. These are unprecedented times, as we well know, and certainly our thoughts from the Board of Trustees to each and every one of you is extended to us. In light of our um, cooperative principles, the seven cooperative principles, specifically principles one and two, voluntary and open membership and democratic member control, I'd like to start this morning before the invocation with the founding document of our nation, the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. 
And now, if you will, please bow with me and join in an attitude of prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May the blessings to the Firelands Electric Cooperative's leadership, employees, staff, and all member owners be in our thoughts and prayers on this day and in the days and months to come. Amen. And now let us honor America by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It is now my honor and privilege to um, introduce the president of the Board of Trustees of Firelands Electric Cooperative, Mr. Dan Schlummer. Dan? Good morning, everyone. I now call the 82nd Annual Meeting of Firelands Electric Cooperative to order. The Secretary reports that the required quorum was obtained through mail and online ballot process. I now call Secretary Carl Erge to the podium for the reading of the meeting notice, proof of mailing, and approval of the 2019 Annual Meeting Minutes. On May 29, 2020, I caused to be mailed to each member of the cooperative at their address, as it appears in the records of the cooperative, a notice of the annual meeting of the members of the cooperative. The notice stated the time, place, and purpose of the meeting and was published in the June issue of Ohio Cooperative Living Magazine. I have received from Jeff McAllister managing editor of the Ohio Rural Electric Cooperatives, the publisher of Ohio Cooperative Living Magazine, an affidavit verifying that a notice of the annual meeting was mailed to each member of Firelands Electric Cooperative Incorporated at their addresses that appear on the books of the cooperative. The affidavit of June 10, 2020, along with a copy with the notice, will be recorded in the minutes book of the cooperative. The minutes of the June 22, 2019 annual meeting are available on our website. If there are no questions from the Board of Trustees who are present with me regarding the minutes, I would entertain a motion that the reading of the minutes be waived and they be approved as presented. Do I hear such a motion? Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, same sign. The motion is carried. Thank you. I now call to the podium attorney David Harwood to review the election process. Good morning. This year, Firelands, for the first time, conducted its election of trustees by mail and electronic ballot. At last year's annual meeting, the members approved amendments to our code of regulations, which permit our elections to be conducted by mail and electronically. When an election is conducted in this manner, the members are provided with a ballot that identifies the candidates, instructs the members on how to cast their ballot, 
and states the time and date at which the ballot must be completed and returned in order to be counted. No actual voting takes place at the annual meeting. Instead, just the election results are announced. Last year's code amendments also gave the board the authority to hire an independent third party to conduct any election which is to be held by mail or electronically. But while the manner in which we cast our votes was changed, the process of nominating candidates for the board was not changed. Any member residing in a district from which a trustee is to be elected and who wishes to run for trustee from that district files a petition signed by at least 20 members of the cooperative who are residents of that district. If the petition is properly completed and signed by at least 20 residents of the district and the petition is timely filed with the cooperative, then that member becomes an official candidate for the board and stands for election. This year, there were three districts electing trustees to the board, districts one, three, and six. Dan Schlomer filed a petition for trustee from District 1, Tom Luca from District 3, and Kevin Reedy from District 6. The board this year retained co-op ballot of Columbus, Ohio to conduct the election. Co-op ballot mailed ballots containing the names of all the candidates to our members. The members were instructed that the ballots could be returned by mail, but were also provided with instructions on how, if they wished, they could instead cast their votes electronically. Voting this year commenced on May 1st and had to be returned by Wednesday, June 17 at 11.59 p.m. Co-op ballot has reported to the Cooperative's Election Committee that a total of 671 votes were cast this year, 616 of those by mail and 55 electronically. This reflects that just over 8.5% of our members voted in this year's election. In the past several years, the number of votes cast at our in-person elections at annual meetings averaged approximately 300 ballots, or just over a 3% member participation rate. The board hopes that in future elections, mail balloting will continue to increase the number of members participating in our election process. All three of our races this year were uncontested, and Co-op Ballot has certified to the cooperative that Dan Schlomer has been elected trustee from District 1, Tom Luca from District 3, and Kevin Reedy from District 6. Congratulations to our newly elected trustees. And now, at this time, I'm going to turn our meeting back over to President Dan Schlomer. Thank you. Well, good morning again, everyone. Today's annual meeting is a big change from decades of in-person meetings where members could get together to vote, have breakfast and fellowship, and hear about the latest happenings at Firelands Electric Cooperative. These are unsettling times for all of us. Thanks to all of you who took the time to attend this virtual annual meeting. Thanks also to those of you who voted by mail or internet. 18 or so months ago, board and management began discussions on code changes to allow voting outside of the annual meeting. Our idea at the time was to increase participation among the membership. Little did we know, that a virtual meeting would become essential so quickly. This change has increased voting participation from 3.4% at last year's annual meeting to about 9% this year via both mail and internet and your cooperative board and staff are thrilled to see that kind of increase. I want to take a few minutes to recognize outgoing board member, Steve Gray. Steve served one term as trustee, taking the seat of longtime board member Donna Woodworth. It's difficult to fit in board meetings while operating a large farm operation, 
especially during planting and harvesting seasons. With all of that going on, Steve decided not to run for a second term. We found Steve to be the type of board member who would evaluate all the variables before making a thoughtful decision, and we will miss his insight. I would also like to welcome Tom Lucha to the board. I can tell you that Tom has taken more time than any board candidate than I can remember in preparing for this job. He has attended a number of board meetings as an observer, and we look forward to his input in the important decisions that need to be made. Now to a quick operations summary for the past year. I hope you had a chance to read the insert in the Ohio Cooperative Magazine that among other items lists the financial results of your cooperative as audited by our accounting firm, BHM CPA Group. And I might add that the audit was clean in all respects. As you may have seen, 2019 had reduced operating margins, primarily due to lower kilowatt hour sales and expenses associated with the sale of our old buildings and the move to the new facility. While still a strong year financially, last year's operating margins were down about 33% from the 2018 record year. As many of you know, Margins are the major source for spending to keep our system reliable, make principal payments on loans, and return capital credits to our members. Your board is committed to ongoing improvements to our system. We have 995 miles of lines, substations, and equipment that all needs continuous upgrade. In fact, our system capital expenditures budget for the four years ending in 2024 is $10 million. And think back just a couple weeks ago when a tropical storm blew through our area with 70 mile per hour winds. That's when our investment in the system, in equipment, and you might say our investment in people all paid off. There were 1,800 outages restored most in just a few hours, but all by the end of 32 hours. For 2020, the board has authorized a general capital credit retirement of $730,000. In keeping with the need to reserve enough margins for the investments I just mentioned, this amount is lower compared to last year's $1 million retirement that was based on strong 2018 margins. All of this leads me to the rate increase improved, approved by the board earlier this year, the first increase in four years. Beginning this month, the residential fixed charge will increase by $2 per month and residential kilowatt hour charge will increase by 3.27%. Commercial and other rates will go up correspondingly. Please know that rate increases are authorized only after a great deal of financial planning and analysis and in light of the critical investments that we believe are essential. Before I let you go, I want to bring up a major initiative now being considered by board and management, and that topic is broadband. As you may have heard, there is a push at various levels of government to improve the quality of life in rural areas by providing access to high-speed internet. The need was magnified this year by the shutdown of schools and some businesses where students and employees were asked to work from home. This became a problem for some households in the Firelands footprint as internet in some areas lacks consistent availability and in many cases upload and download speeds are just not acceptable. Your cooperative has engaged studies performed by two different companies to look at the feasibility of providing high speed fiber optic cable to our members and others in our service territory. I want to emphasize that we are still in the learning phase. 
there are many questions that need to be asked. Among these questions are, how would the organization be structured and staffed? And what sources of financing are available to cover the large capital investment in fiber, equipment, and startup costs? There is some urgency in deciding whether or not to move forward. Later this year, the federal government will open up a bidding process for grant funds in selected census tracts that are determined to be underserved. The Federal Communications Commission has established the Rural Development Opportunity Fund, known as RDOF, as a source of these grants. In the view of your board and management, these funds are essential to operate an economically viable business. If we were to lose out on these funds, your cooperative would be hard pressed to roll out broadband. One of the drivers of this effort is concern for community. One of the seven cooperative principles. Your board has an interest in improving the lives of our members and the areas we serve. At the same time, we would be entering in a line of business outside of the energy business that we know. It really comes down to this. We need to balance the risk of a large undertaking like broadband with the potential benefits to our members. Look for more to come on this as we continue our due diligence. As I look to the rest of 2020 and on into the future, my thoughts are that we are in a good spot. We are investing in the things we need to take care of in our system, and we're looking for ways to benefit our members for many years to come. Know that you have a team of management, employees, and board members that truly have the best interests of the members at heart. Thank you for your kind attention. Please take a few moments to review the video from our statewide organization, Ohio's Electric Cooperatives. Your cooperative community stretches far beyond your local borders, across the state, across the country, and around the world, to become a powerful network that accomplishes great things by working together. The Nationwide Electric Cooperative Network did just that in 2019, when consumer members and employees across the country rallied their lawmakers in Washington to achieve three big legislative wins that save money for consumers and support their communities. Thanks to a months-long grassroots movement, with support from every Ohio legislator, Congress passed its year-end spending bill with a provision that protects electric co-ops from losing their tax-exempt status when they accept government grant money, even for disaster recovery or broadband internet expansion. It was an unintended consequence of the 2017 tax law that co-op advocates spent countless hours working to fix. Two more fixes were included in that year-end spending bill that help your cooperative compete for high-quality employees and save money. The first eliminated a proposed tax on health care benefits, and the second reduced the cost of insurance your cooperative pays to protect employee pension benefits. In Ohio, your co-op's representatives protected consumer members from paying fees imposed by House Bill 6, which affected customers of other types of electric utilities. Ohio's electric cooperatives also hosted the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for its rollout of the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, which will give us the flexibility we need to continue serving you with affordable, safe, reliable, and clean electricity. Affordability is possible because we work together as a co-op network to make sound financial decisions that help keep your power generation costs down, even as we invest in better, more reliable transmission lines that will improve your service for the long run. Your power generation rates have been stable for eight years, and that stability will continue in the foreseeable future. The cooperative network is so powerful because of you, our consumer members. 2020 is another big year for elections, 
And don't forget that your voice and your vote matter. Check your voter registration. Learn about the candidates and cast your ballot this year in your local, state, and national elections. Voting is the best way to make sure that your community's priorities are your lawmakers' priorities. If you want more reliable electricity and stable rates, if you want your community to prosper by having access to the same opportunities that are found in cities, then use your voice and vote. Our strength in numbers enhances the power of the cooperative network. It all comes down to community. In 2019, Ohio Electric Cooperatives returned more than $39 million to their consumers. Co-op consumers also gave $1.7 million to nonprofits, churches, fire and police organizations, and individuals through their electric bill roundup programs. Co-ops and their consumers take care of their neighbors, including those around the globe. The power of our co-op network extends to Guatemala, where Ohio co-op linemen traveled in March 2020 to bring electricity to people who have never had it before. The third trip they've taken since 2016. The power of the co-op network was strong in 2019. We look forward to working with you to accomplish even more in 2020. And now I would ask General Manager Dan McNall to come to the podium for his report. Good morning, everyone. I too wish to welcome you to this first ever Firelands Electric Cooperative virtual annual meeting. I used to joke before the onset of the coronavirus that virtual meant pretend. Well, that assessment quickly changed with the onset of the coronavirus and virtual meetings soon became reality. And I had to master the social etiquette of knowing when to mute and when to unmute. Now, hopefully today, before I'm finished, none of you will feel the urge to mute me and turn me off. I've always looked forward to annual meeting and the opportunity it presents for the trustees and management to meet with the members, to pass on ideas and for us to communicate with you and explain to you some of the initiatives taking place at your cooperative. I wanna begin my comments today by extending a special thank you to the Firelands employees who quickly learned new technologies in order to make this meeting possible today. I especially wanna thank Andrea Gravenhorse and Tracy Gibb for setting up everything needed from software to the online voting and phone connections. They are the ones who made this meeting possible today. Now, today's virtual meeting is one of many changes implemented at Firelands in the last three months in response to the coronavirus pandemic. And I want to commend all of the Firelands employees who embraced and accepted the risks of being part of an essential service, and they kept working daily throughout the entire coronavirus event. I especially want to thank our Director of Human Resources, Shelley Magyar, for staying up to date on ever-changing regulations and safety protocols, and for her guidance and help in navigating us through this time. And last of all, I wanna say thank you to the members, especially to the members. The members who accepted sudden changes here in the form of our lobby being closed, which it does remain closed today, and also the temporary closing our drive-through window, which is now reopened for business. So thank you to the members for your understanding and cooperation there. Now, looking at the pandemic and its financial impact on Firelands, we are estimating a reduction in 2020 margins in the range of $75,000. This is due primarily to unpaid bills and loss of fee revenue, which resulted from a March through June statewide moratorium on utility disconnects for non-payment. Starting on July 13th, we will return to our normal collections procedures, including service disconnects for non-pay. We will be working very closely with members and making special extended payment arrangements 
to assist accounts that fell behind during the moratorium period. Looking back at 2019, it was a very productive year for your cooperative. Of course, we had the move to the new building, which with its additional space allowed us to do pro proper social distancing, allowed us to continue working on a limited basis here during the statewide coronavirus short shutdown. And when talking about buildings, I'm pleased to tell you that in September of last year, we completed the sale of all four of the old buildings that formerly housed our operations. In 2019, we continued to make investments and upgrades to our electric distribution system with an emphasis on projects that will enhance reliability, power quality, and safety to our members, workers, and the public. Last year, nearly 11 miles of new three-phase lines were built in the Hayesville area, while five different single-phase line rebuild projects were done in New London. And we continued with our annual right-of-way maintenance program, trimming trees on 317 miles of lines at a cost of nearly a half million dollars. And I want to express my thanks to the members who understand the importance of keeping trees away from and out of electric lines and members who graciously allowed our contractors onto their property to do necessary tree maintenance work. Last year, I mentioned to you preliminary plans to undertake a four-year, $10 million construction work plan in 2020. Preliminary design work on this construction plan is now underway. Included in it are 38 miles of power line rebuilds and a second transmission feed to New London. Construction on the first phase of this project is slated to begin later this year on a line rebuild project in Ancient County, south of Route 30. Now, along with investments in infrastructure, we've also made significant investments in technology and computer systems. It's well known that the technology age has opened the door for theft and deceit by computer hackers who attempt to steal data or take computer systems hostage and then making them inoperable until a ransom is paid. Recently, we contracted with a cybersecurity consulting firm to conduct a thorough test of our networks and systems. They used simulated attacks attempting to breach our firewalls and gain improper access. And after three weeks of testing, I'm pleased to say that the firewalls performed as intended, allowing zero breaches. We have and will continue to make necessary investments in our technology and security in order to protect not only the cooperative systems, but also to safeguard your personal account information. One of the seven cooperative principles is concern for community. The Firelands Electric Operation Roundup People's Fund is a great local example of that principle. Founded in 1995, Firelands members through a voluntary rounding up of their monthly electric bills to the next even dollar, had contributed over $1.1 million to the People's Fund. These funds, overseen by a board of nine volunteers, have been awarded to special projects and special needs within our communities. All applications are thoroughly researched and critiqued as part of the review and approval process. In 2019, grant awards were made to hospices, volunteer fire departments, food pantries, community centers, and individuals for things like air packs, oxygen cylinders, lighting systems, roof replacements, freezer repairs, ditch cleaning, and toilet paper. I would like to recognize the nine People's Fund board members and officers, starting with Mike Walter, current president, Maxine Swaysgood, past president, Tony Swindoll, secretary, Laura Landis, excuse me, Tony Swindoll, Vice President, and Laura Landis, Secretary, Mary Rees, Gary Hunter, Donna Woodworth, Anna Strine, and Mary Jo Paramore. Thank you, Operation Roundup board members, for donating your time, and thank you to Firelands board members who participate in this program that makes a difference in our communities. Now, as I approach my time limit, I'd like to remind you of one other important electric cooperative program. Acre Co-op Owners for Political Action, which allows co-op members like yourself to be part of a state and federal grassroots movement that collectively bands us together 
and makes our voices heard on issues that impact the electric cooperatives. Acre Co-op Owners for Political Action is a bipartisan political action committee that focuses on issues rather than politics, with no regards whatsoever for political party orientation. For a $25 annual contribution, you can join more than 36,000 members nationwide to ensure that your voice and the voices of rural America and small town America are heard in Columbus and Washington, D.C. It's easy to join and your $25 contribution can be included on your Firelands bill for only $2.08 per month. Last year, Firelands Electric held its first ever Acre Co-op Owners Breakfast here at the headquarters. Attendees had an opportunity to personally meet and get firsthand updates and behind the scenes looks from a U.S. Congressman, a state senator, and a state representative. Please join me in watching a short video highlighting Acre Co-op Owners. Whether we like it or not, legislation can impact the ability to provide safe, reliable, affordable power. That's why it's important to elect individuals who understand the concerns of America's electric cooperatives. It's also why so many cooperative members choose to join Acre Co-op Owners for Political Action. Acre Co-op Owners brings together cooperative members from across the country who are dedicated to making their voices heard on issues affecting their electric bills as well as the quality of power in their homes, businesses, and communities. A grassroots movement, the group is powered by more than 6,000 co-op members in Ohio and over 34,000 throughout the U.S. Contributions from those who belong to Acre Co-op Owners are used to support candidates on both the state and federal levels who recognize the unique needs of member-owned electric cooperatives. As a bipartisan organization, it backs those who support the goals of the nation's electric co-ops, regardless of their political party. Having elected officials who are on the same page as electric cooperatives is essential. It places advocates for the co-op at the heart of the policy-making arena. By understanding the concerns of rural America, these legislators can encourage the passage of policies that help electric co-ops continue to provide dependable power and quality service to 42 million Americans. Acre Co-op Owners is tasked with educating others about the distinctive business model of electric cooperatives, including its advantages and its challenges to both current and potential lawmakers. Through newsletters and other communications, the organization also serves as a tool to keep co-op members informed of proposed legislation that could affect their electricity. Become a member of Acre Co-op Owners today and make your voice heard. I encourage everyone to consider becoming an Acre member. Watch for your July Cooperative Living Magazine. It will have in it a membership enrollment form. If you're already a member, your enrollment will automatically continue and you do not need to reapply. Now, 2018 was a year of accomplishments, challenges, and changes. And as we all know, 2020 has started out with even more challenges and changes. One of those challenges referenced 
previously by President Schlomer, occurred last Wednesday evening when a windstorm ravaged the southern half of our system. Our 10 linemen with the support of operations staff back here in the office immediately responded and toiled from Wednesday evening to past 3 a.m. Friday morning with minimal breaks working until everyone's power was restored. Our outstanding group of FireLens employees is always ready to meet whatever challenges appear. Through their hard work, dedication, loyalty, and commitment, they conscientiously deliver safe, reliable, and affordable electricity to each and every member. It is my pleasure at this time to share with you the faces and names of your FireLens Electric Cooperative employees. Introducing your cooperative employees. Line Superintendent, Zach Collins. Director of Operations, Don Inglet. Director of Member Services, Communications and IT, Andrea Gravenhorst. Human Resources Coordinator, Shelley Magyar. Director of Finance and Accounting, Tabby Shepard. Operations Assistant, Holly Beach Barber. Journeyman Lineman, Rick Bowers. Energy Advisor and Key Accounts Contractor, Scott Carberry. Journeyman Lineman, Evan Clemens. Communications and Member Relations Specialist, Tracy Gibb. Lead Lineman, Fred Hartman. Consumer Services Representative, Lisa Haynes. Meter Technician, Ken Keener. Apprentice Lineman, Chris Kent. System Right-Away Coordinator, James Miller. Accountant, Colleen Patton. Lead Lineman, Phil Pickering. Journeyman Lineman, Chris Rowland. Consumer Services and AMI Coordinator, Stephanie Schmidt. Part-time Consumer Services Representative, Jessica Schwanger. Engineering Services Representative, Kurt Shepard. Apprentice Lineman, Robert Shepard. Journeyman Lineman, Dave Sumpner. Lead Lineman, Rob Swiger. Accounting Clerk, Cindy Thompson. Apprentice Lineman, Matt Whiteside. Engineering Data Analyst, Melissa Wilson. And Office Services Assistant, Melissa Zacharias. Firelands members, you've successfully made it to the end of my comments. You've been a wonderful audience this morning, and for the first time ever, I can say that throughout my entire talk, I didn't see a single person fall asleep or even act bored. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for taking your time to tune into this annual meeting of your cooperative. Please, throughout the year, feel free to call me anytime at the office with your questions, concerns, or comments. I now yield to Firelands President, Mr. Dan Schlomer, for the conclusion of today's meeting. Fireless members, we're almost to the conclusion. Is there any old or new business to be brought before this meeting? Hearing none, I just want to say that, uh, give my thanks to all of you for attending this virtual meeting. And I look forward to next year when we can all tune into the evening news and not, not hear the words COVID or 19. Hope to see you all face to face next year. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? And is there a second? This meeting is adjourned.